Welcome to TinyML Talks. It's our great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this uh, first inaugural uh, meetup of the Moroccan TinyML chapter. Today we'll be uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ravi Sivalingam uh, from Qualcomm, who will be presenting TinyML enabling ultra low power always on, uh, on computer vision at Qualcomm. Well, first we'll start by thanking our sponsors, Aeon Devices, ARM, um, uh, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, EMSA, Green Waves, Latent AI, Hotsi, Imagine Mob, Maxim Integrated, Analog Devices, EXO, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Seed, SenseML, Sense, Sense, Sentient. Uh, we're happy also to talk about, uh, to mention our live online uh, event, the China Meetup uh, event on November, uh, from 2nd of November to 5th of November uh, of this year. And you all welcome to join. All the registration links are available on the website. And also we want to thank our technical uh, program committee uh, members. Uh, recently, quite recently, we had uh, launched the vision uh, challenge. Submission is uh, uh, closed now, and uh, the winners have been announced on the uh, TinyML website. Our next TinyML talk will be on Tuesday, October, October uh, 12th, by David Schwarz, the uh, user success engineer at Edge Impulse. And he will be talking about AutoML, TinyML, which Edge Impulse, Aeon Tuner. So stay tuned and register. You're welcome to register for this event. Uh, it's our great pleasure to welcome uh, Ravi Shankar Sivalingam. Uh, Ravi Shankar Sivalingam obtained his MS uh, degree in computer science and electrical engineering and PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. He specializes in sparse modeling for computer vision. He was a founding member of the computational intelligence team at 3M Corporate R&D, Minnesota, where he applied machine learning and computer vision to applications in uh, the diverse businesses operated by 3M, ranging from biometrics to dental and orthodontic products. He also worked at uh, June Life, a startup bringing computer vision technology to the smart kitchen of the future. Currently, Ravi deploys machine learning algorithms for, or for uh, ultra low power computer vision at Qualcomm AI Research in Santa Clara. And we are very happy to have you uh, with us, Ravi, in this uh, first inaugural um, talk of our uh, Moroccan chapter uh, meetup. And we are very happy to welcome you and floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hajar, and thank you, Mona, for inviting me for this inaugural Moroccan meetup. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, as you mentioned, we'll be talking about enabling ultra low power always on computer vision with Qualcomm's QCC 112. Um, yeah, just a, a few slides. Uh, let's talk a little bit about TinyML and how far we've come in the last few years. Uh, TinyML is broadly defined as uh, machine learning architectures, techniques, tools, and approaches. So this encompasses hardware, software, systems, uh, everything for uh, performing on-device analytics, inference, on-device training for a variety of sensing modalities, be it vision, audio, motion sensing, or any other kind of sensing you can think of, at really in the milliwatt range of power. So single digit milliwatts are below. And the goal for this is you know, targeting predominantly battery operated devices, and typically IoT use cases, bioelectronics, and so on. Uh, in fact, NEML is, is becoming so big, uh, ABI Research recently uh, published a white paper called the TinyML, the next big opportunity in tech. And they estimate that 1 million TinyML devices will be shipped in 2024 with an installed base of about 5.4 billion TinyML devices in 2026, as soon as 2026. So it's a really exciting space to be. It's rapidly growing, which can also be seen by the rapid growth of people in the community uh, uh, organized by the TinyML Foundation at tinyml.org. When we first had the TinyML Summit back in 2019, we had about 160 uh, attendees from uh, 90 companies. 
This year, we had over 5,000 attendees from over 300 companies. And our LinkedIn group has over 2,000 members, meetup groups across the world have over 6,500 members, and YouTube subscribers over 5,000. And we have over 300 videos on our YouTube channel on which this talk will also be put up. We actually have over 6,500 members in 36 TinyML uh, meetup groups, uh, over 29 countries. Uh, it's actually funny, the meetup website map is kind of incorrect, but it's kind of showing the Moroccan meetup uh, that's supposed to be here. It's like the red dot is slightly further away when you zoom out, but we'll get that fixed by the ne next Moroccan meetup. Uh, please go to this link to join any meetup group that is uh, closer to your geographical area. As uh, Hajar mentioned, the Vision Challenge uh, of 2021, Tiny ML Vision Challenge 2021, uh, sponsored by Hackster and several of our other sponsors. Uh, the winners were announced just a couple of days ago. We've had like really, really great submissions from a wide variety of use cases from people from all around the world. We had the three winners, the first, second, and third prizes listed above here. And uh, we have a couple of honorable mentions and an impact prize as well. So please go check out at the link provided here. The link will be provided with the slides when we distribute it. Uh, there are other kinds of upcoming events organized by TinyML, the TinyML Success Story Series, uh, hosted by Professor Kurt Kreutzer from UC Berkeley and Chris Rowan from Cisco. We'll also have TinyML panel sessions. The first one coming up about TinyML for conservation, scheduled for October 19th. The next TinyML summit coming up in March, 2022 in Silicon Valley, California is being chaired by Adam and Luca and uh, you can register for that or if you're interested in sponsoring that, please reach out to sponsorships at tinyml.org. All right, let's dive into the main topic, TinyML at Qualcomm. So just a little bit of background. Um, we've had always on uh, UI uh, for contextual awareness with a variety of different sensor modalities previously. We have always on touch. We're so used to it right now. We don't think about it twice. Uh, in fact, uh, when you show kids laptops that do not have a touch screen, they try to touch the screen and swipe on it. They're so used to that. It's so pervasive right now. Always on voice, we thought it, it was it's only been here for uh, a few years, but it's become so pervasive now. Again, when it first came on, came along, we thought that it was, it was new, it was intriguing, and perhaps we were a little hesitant or skeptical about it because it's always listening. But now most of us have it uh, at least in our phone or many other devices in the house. Always on motion is probably one of the oldest, um, you know, always on sensor modalities. Uh, with a gyroscope, accelerometer, and magnetometer for uh, you know motion tracking, and that's there in your phone and many other devices or wearable devices that you may have. However, vision is missing in that list, and human insight, as you know, is dominated by vision. Like most of our perception of the external world is through vision, but always on vision technologies deploying it in commercial solutions has been quite challenging in the past few uh, until recently. Machine vision today, uh, in the past few as past few decades coming up, the conventional approaches have been pretty power hungry. The actual image sensing itself takes about 10 milliwatt, and then there is IO power to transmit that image to the processor. And the processor, when it's running these algorithms to do object detection or classification or whatever it may be, it usually takes about hundreds of milliwatts. And, and of course, this is use case specific and processor specific. Um, most of the time, this may happen in the cloud, or uh, if it happens in the edge, it is usually limited to certain higher power devices. Uh, as a typical example uh, for gesture recognition, the processing takes over 90% of the uh, power consumption compared to acquisition and, and IO power. And the total uh, sum of the SPI chart here is about hundreds of milliwatts. Uh, but if you're able to get vision down to a really, really low power where you can en enable it uh, to be always on, this can enhance many use cases in a variety of different verticals, like on your devices, like smartphones, wearables, like smartwatches, and now wearables are getting smaller and smaller, like a ring uh, that you can wear. Uh, your tablets, virtual reality headsets, they're, they're coming to the market very rapidly. They're growing right now, many, many companies working on that. 
And in a smart home setting where like an intelligent occupancy trigger that is not just using like a PIR sensor to detect heat, but actually an intelligent occupancy sensor, which doesn't trigger when your pet walks into the room, but triggers when you walk into the room. And so there are many such use cases that can be enabled when we bring vision down to such a low power that it can be always on. So in Qualcomm, uh, we've uh, worked on bringing to you this new vision module, which we call Qualcomm QCC 112. And it's a highly integrated and fully optimized system. And it's uh, with always on vision with an end-to-end -end power, active end-to-end -end power of less than one million. So when you mean end-to-end -end power, this includes the lens, this includes the image sensing, this includes the processing, all the way up to getting the metadata out of the sensor. Uh, and it's a very small size device, as you can see here, it's very low cost. And uh, most important thing, as I mentioned previously about always on audio and, and skepticism surrounding it for privacy reasons, I, we can totally imagine that this is also causes some privacy concerns. But that, that's why we actually call this a always on computer vision sensor and not a camera, because privacy is uh, kind of held in mind from the, it's built in from the ground up with privacy in mind, right? The output is only metadata, as you saw in this slide. It doesn't actually transmit the image. In later these slide, in these slides, we'll be showing you some images, but there's only for sake of the presentation or for you know uh, testing and development. But in an actual commercial product, only metadata will be output, and uh, so that kind of gives you privacy, and and people will be more comfortable having this in their homes. And this is configurable for many use cases. We'll walk through various different applications. It has a QVGA, a quarter VGA, so 240 by 320 image sensor. And it is also near IR compatible. So it helps a lot in low light scenarios. So this is a commercially available chipset called QCC112, supports many use cases. Uh, it, and it has, uh, includes the chip, the sensor and onboard power management. There's an ultra low power microcontroller. It has a streaming RA processor, which can be programmable and used for certain high end use cases and can also be power collapse when not needed. It is an embedded power management. It's a vision accelerator that enables us to run these computer vision uh, uh, you know, algorithms like object detection at a very, very low power. And it has custom memory, which enables us to also keep at this low power. So just a comparison of our approach with traditional approaches uh, used for computer vision. Uh, in what we are trying to do with low power computer vision, the image quality, and the metrics associated with that are less important than the uh, computer vision informa uh, inf information that is extracted from the image. So the image quality or whether it's color or monochrome uh, or eight bits res uh, you know, resolution, uh, whether the focus is uh, high or low autofocus and high resolution, right? We talked about that this was only a QVG sensor, only 240 by 320 pixels compared to the several megapixel in, uh, sensors that are there in your phone cameras. But for always on low power scenarios, it is sufficient to have this sort of a limited spec camera. And in addition to just looking at the algorithm power or the sensor power or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the processor power, in this solution, we have optimized the entire system power, as I mentioned, in, including the sensor, including the processing, including transferring the metadata. IO everything. And that is uh, that sort of holistic approach is necessary to develop such low power uh, solutions for computer vision. Uh, in, in some use cases, like in, in, in data sets that you may find in, for computer vision or for you know, like cell phone type use cases, the camera and the subject are really posed for the best image. Uh, but in typical examples, like IoT examples where a low power solution, vision solution may be deployed, the images may be shot in some challenging lighting. And we, We'll show some examples of such images in later slides. And we need to be able to uh, robustly perform our tasks in that scenario as well. Uh, inference is heavily weighted. We, we actually focus a lot more on making inference very fast, even at the expense of training being slower. Like you can do a lot of things, you pre-calculate and pre-train a lot of things so that at inference time, you don't have to do a lot of computation and you can save on power and, um, uh, uh, latency. So, hey, uh, Ravi, this is Mona. Um, I have a question. Hi, everyone. This is Mona El Khatib, CEO and CTO at Aeon Devices. 
Ravi, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned you don't allow uh, image transfer to the cloud. Mm -hmm. But uh, multiple applications require uh, cloud verification, right. which basically happens only when the edge device detects the, the, the interesting events, which then does not pose a lot of privacy issues because you don't constantly transfer the data only when it's necessary. Um, so what's your input on that? Right. So, uh, first of all, in, in this ship, there is a mode, that there is a fuse that you can burn that prevents people from uh, transmitting images. Uh, in, in certain applications, if you do need to transmit images and privacy is less of a concern, you can, you know, leave that unfused. So, that, that uh, capability is present. Now, for security and privacy reasons, if you're transmitting images once versus multiple times, uh, it's not a matter of transmitting it consistently, but sometimes it's about the security of if there is a hook to transmit images, somebody may be able to penetrate that uh, security and access all images all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So that is something that the uh, final, uh, you know, the consumer product maker has to be aware of mm -hmm. uh, uh, when they integrate this into their solution. So this is uh, a standard in the voice and audio. So I'm surprised um, it's not the case for vision. So uh, like I said, you know, you can do that. You can choose to do that. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, the final end product uh, maker, the ODM mm -hmm. the, who decides how to do that. So we have the hook to do it. It's mm -hmm. just that we also have a capability to burn that fuse and, and prevent anybody from accessing images at all if that is a concern, in, okay. especially in very sensitive use cases, right? Like you can totally imagine something like this being deployed in a restroom for mm -hmm. elder monitoring, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, monitoring, uh, and you don't want, uh, a, you know, the, that image being transmitted anywhere, anytime, right? Because mm -hmm. of privacy reasons. So for that, this allows you to do that. No, that I understand, but there are some use cases where if there is a false alarm due to the detection in your chip and decision is uh, has the bad consequences on right. the person you're taking, uh, you know, you're processing the image, then you want the cloud verification, which has much higher processing power. So, right. okay, so, so you support both basically. We support both, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yep, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we are waiting heavily on inference and the algorithms are devised with memory and power in mind. So uh, we have to be very careful, like every multiply, every division, every division, for example, in a, in a very low power, very constrained microcontroller uh, adds a lot of, uh, adds some power, right? So we're very careful of that when we come up with the algorithms. And also compared to frame-based metrics that are usually used in, in like academic publications, uh, for typical applications, the metrics may be event-based. So you don't care so much about detecting a person in every single frame, but when a person enters, you want to be able to reliably detect them and uh, within the latency requirements. So the metrics will not be uh, typically the kind of same kind of metric that you may see in, in academic publications. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Favoring algorithms that run very efficiently, uh, one of the main things is looking at adaptive compute. Compared to some of the neural network, uh, standard neural network algorithms, which really, whether you show it a picture of a blank wall or you show it a picture with like multiple faces, it will take the same amount of inference time it, because it does the same amount of number crunching to process that image. However, we favor algorithms that have uh, adaptive compute where only uh, interesting parts of the image are processed uh, further and less interesting or very unchanged parts of the image over time, they're not processed uh, as much. They're not, uh, uh, they're processed with the lightweight algorithms first and then ignored and the more complex later parts of the algorithms are run only on uh, the regions of the image that have changed or on frames that have changed. Also, um, you can stop the algorithm when there is enough information, right? So in certain applications, you don't need to count every single person in the scene, but you need to know whether there is at least one person in the scene or the scene is empty. And so you can uh, save a lot of power in those kind of applications by uh, doing this adaptive compute bypassing or you know, interrupting the algorithm process when at least one object has been detected. Other things include uh, you know, being able to effectively run multi-scale object detection. So the typical approach is resizing the images with fractional scales, which is usually a very computationally intensive operation. But we have, uh, uh, in our solution, we've deployed a way where it resizes images only with like powers of two. So it's a little easier. You don't have to do interpolation, but you can still 
do multi-scale object detection within those scales. Also, the algorithms themselves, the features that are used are optimized such that they favor detection at all kinds of brightness levels. So we can detect a face, whether it's at you know, zero lux, one lux, or extremely bright scenarios with adversarial lighting. And we'll show some sample images of that later. Uh, and again, as mentioned before, the entire system is optimized. We use a low power image sensor with a low resolution, monochrome, and we optimize the IO path there. And uh, the algorithms that are the most computationally intensive are implemented in hardware. The model is changeable, so you can train models for different use cases and deploy them, but the algorithms, the, the actual number crunching happens in really hard, hardened components there. Uh, here are some okay. typical use cases that we see. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. There is a question in the Q&A that mm -hmm. uh, the, Raul wants you to elaborate a bit more on the performance achieved on application like humans detection in terms of latency and accuracy and how can it be customized? Right, okay. that's a good question. Yeah, so uh, it depends on the model that we deploy and uh, the particular use case requirements because we can tune those, right? So we have shown human detection with latency as less, uh, less than like you know, 100 milliseconds. And our models are typically of the size ranging from 50 kilobytes to 100 kilobytes for human detection. And depending on the distance with which you want to be able to detect the person or not, the model complexity increases. And uh, we can tune, uh, we can select operating points in our model. And I'll show you in our training tool slide towards the end uh, that, each model has a like a Pareto operating curve, and so the the customer uh, who's making the uh, application can decide whether they want higher true positives and, uh, for you know higher false positives, or like uh, you know trade off the false positives and true positives, and also latency. So you, you can tune that for your particular application with images acquired from your particular application scenario. But uh, for, for example, the numbers that, uh, some numbers that we have for phase detection, we have in the very high 99% true positive rate at very, very low sub 1% or sub 0.1% false positive rate. Okay, thank you, Ravi. So yeah, uh, in this example, we show uh, different kinds of uh, body models for human detection, especially because for indoor scenarios, you may not be able to, the rooms may be small enough that you won't be able to see the full person, but you can still detect using our half body model. You can also use a very lightweight change detection algorithm, uh, which in many use cases might be sufficient to solve your problem rather than running a more uh, slightly more expensive uh, object detection algorithm. Uh, our hardware also enables you to run uh, object detection at four orientations, even if you train the model uh, for only one orientation. So at the bottom right, you see an example where the face was trained, the face model was trained only for a zero degree orientation and by just setting certain bits in the hardware config, you can enable it to run at four different orientations as indicated by the uh, four faces there. And this is helpful because in some use cases, you may mount the camera in, in portrait mode or in landscape mode. And the, this enables you to at runtime or at deployment phase, but just choose that option without having to retrain the model. Uh, here we'd like to show some examples. of person detection and occupancy, where this QCC, uh, actually this one video that I missed, here's an example with phone and tablet use cases, using face detection, what kind of um, you know, applications we enable. So here we have the QCC 112 embedded inside this uh, phone at the top there. And uh, I don't know if it's very clear here, but the person's face is being detected in the, in the camera. We can also use this to, uh, since it's very low power, it can always be on and it can be used to auto wake the screen or the device uh, based on whether the face is detected or not. So when the face is not detected, the screen turns off and the face is detected, the screen turns back on. And you can also use it to uh, use it for your laptops, your uh, you know, tablet devices, well, saving power, even though it's always on. It can also be, uh, you know, count multiple faces We've also shown uh, demonstrations where you can detect whether a person is standing behind you and looking at your computer monitor uh, for as a privacy uh, screen. 
Another example you can see here where even at very low light, even just from a backlight from the tablet uh, screen, it's able to detect the face. An additional use case for uh, tablets and uh, mobile devices is automatic screen rotation based on face detection. Uh, the, there's no accelerometer or gyroscope used in this particular uh, demo, uh, but you, you can all relate to the example where you're reading your phone or your tablet when you're lying in bed and when you're turning to the side, the screen turns and you have to manually go and change the rotation lock. However, here using the face orientation, uh, it can automatically rotate the content on the screen. And here's an example with person detection. We can show various to interrupt you again. Just mm -hmm. one question re related to the videos is uh, from Van Kate. He, he said that looks like all the demos are smartphone based. So is QC 112 integrated inside existing Snapdragon uh, SOC? No, that, that's a very good question. It's actually a completely standalone module that we uh, sell. So it's uh, you can add that. Uh, you know, in, in any device, really, uh, it it has uh, the, the thing that you need you do uh, in depending on the application, it does need a host for, for connectivity purposes. Uh, it doesn't have Bluetooth or, um, you know, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, but uh, it's a standalone thing separate from the Snapdragon. Season. Okay, and also one more question from Reza Khosrafi. Can you talk a bit more about the model adaptation and how you optimize a lightweight model for different environments, if you can answer that question also? Sure, uh, yeah. So first of all, uh, you know, data is key, right? So uh, you, you need the data that makes the most sense for your application. Uh, one advantage with our training tool is that you don't need to collect all the training data with just the... Uh, sensor that we, we have, right? So if you already have a large training data set for human detection or some other object detection, you can use our training tools to train the models for this. And you can evaluate a benchmark and optimize the performance using a smaller data set that is collected on this device. So that's something that's, uh, that's key. Um, in terms of uh, for different brightness and stuff, so we do provide a lot of data augmentation in our training tool that allows you to vary that. Uh, also, uh, uh, I should mention that, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned previously, our, the features that we use in our object detection algorithms are somewhat robust to lighting variations, right? So even if you train with um, moderate lighting face detection, I'll show you an example where we are able to detect faces even in their extremely low exposure or, or extremely low illumination. Systems. Okay, thank you, Ravi. Thank you. Uh, and so not just face detection and human detection, that those are things that are pretty common applications and we do provide those stock models with our QCC112 hardware, but it's very easy to train models for various kinds of applications. Here we show an example of a simple fiducial marker. Uh, and this is one of our team members who's also trained uh, to detect like the Indian rupee notes or the new rupee notes. And at the bottom, you're able to see uh, a, of detecting these minion toys for a particular customer application. You can also use it in retail analytics use cases where you have one of, uh, two of these QCC 112 sensors, one pointing into the shelf and counting the uh, items in stock by looking at the item logo or the product logo, or the other one looking outwards towards the customer and uh, using the face detection, tracking it over time and showing that, uh, okay, there are these many people looking at this product and uh, this is live and anonymized information that you can get 24 by seven, rather than what is currently being done for retail analytics, which is somebody is going and like monitoring um, manually, maybe once an hour, whether the shelf is stocked or whether it's empty. So this allows you to do that at very low power. Other things you can do that we've uh, demonstrated is gesture detection, both dynamic and static gesture detection. So on the left, there's an example where the person is like swiping left, right, left, and you can kind of program any kind of uh, gestures that are like a, a sequence of motions. And you can also do static gesture detection. Uh, and we'll show that in our rock, paper, scissors example, just like a toy example that we built up to demonstrate this where the computer is, uh, the player two on the right side of the monitor screen uh, is what the person is showing and that's being detected live and the left is a simulated computer player. 
So you can train uh, your own models for uh, these different gestures and you can run it all concurrently on the device. So uh, going a little bit to practical, uh, you know, scenarios, right? Like in, in typical uh, application settings compared to a, a cell phone camera with a very posed picture, um, we usually operate in very challenging lighting scenarios. You will have very low light. Uh, as some examples on the top there show face detection at very, very low light. Uh, and at the bottom, you see a full body detection, like our body detection at QVG resolution can detect people up to 60 feet away. Uh, it's pretty much um, state of the art. And we also work as low as um, three lux lighting for human body detection. And here's an example of me in our lab, just 20 feet away. Um, also, one of the things that's challenging for uh, typical cameras, uh, the way their auto exposure works, is when you have some adversarial lighting in front of the camera, like a sun shining in front of the camera, the auto exposure just darkens everything to kind of balance things out. But our lightweight ISP basically uh, adapts to, uh, it's kind of tuned to those kind of challenging scenarios where it doesn't darken the rest of the image, but really tries to you know, ignore the overly exposed parts of the image so that it can still have enough contrast to detect uh, the objects of interest in the other parts of the image. And so here's an example where you see full body detection, even though there's a bright sun shining directly at the camera. Yeah, Ravi, related to the uh, lighting conditions, I have a question from Shashank. In low light conditions for always on devices, how do you know when to turn the backlight turn on? Uh, is the sensor capable of detecting in the absence of backlight? Good, yeah. So we actually, all of these things that you see here are without any backlight or any illumination. So full body detection at three lux is without any, any other illumination present at all. So because the sensor is sensitive to infrared illumination, uh, you, can, you can use infrared illumination if you have it. Our sensor can also be used as a, um, you know, uh, ambient light sensor and ALS. So most phones have an ALS. Uh, without the presence of an external lighting calibration lighting source, we can still use our sensor as a light sensor. And if you do have access to an external lighting source, you can use that to turn that on. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey Ravi, one more question uh, regarding the detection from the 20 feet. How is your false alarm? Because it looks like, yeah, yes, you're detecting the body, but uh, I assume false alarm is high because there could be something else looking that shape from that distance. So how yeah. is the false alarm in this case? So for our full body detection that we show, the model that we show here, false alarm rate is very low. It's, it's typically about like 1% or something. Uh, and so if you do have, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, like uh, per frame, that's a per frame false alarm rate, right? So it's a per frame mm -hmm. 1%, but if you use it, depending on the application, when you do a per event based metric, uh, the false alarm can fall much lower depending on how you choose to filter it. And that is very application dependent. So I, I can't, comment specifically on that. But uh, in most applications, uh, that one person per frame false alarm rate translates to sufficient metrics, uh, even base metrics. Yep. Okay. Uh, but but I, I agree with you that uh, if you're, it, it's a trade-off, right? So if you want a very, very high uh, true positive rate, because if you're looking for uh, you know, per frame numbers, you may be giving in to a little bit more false positive rate. That is the truth in, in most machine learning applications, right? Nothing mm -hmm. is 100% perfect, uh, you, but that trade-off is available. And by changing configuration parameters at runtime, the, you, the either the device manufacturer or the end consumer can get the control to change those values, to change mm -hmm. those knobs. And uh, depending on the use case that allows false positives or prefers zero false positives. Mm -hmm. That's great. Here's an example where without any other uh, ambient lighting, I mean, there's only 10 lux illumination and with four millisecond exposure, uh, I don't think it's very visible at all, but there's a very slight hint of a face there that's one of our teammates, uh, but our uh, face detection algorithm is still able to detect it. Because of this, we can actually, um, by tuning the exposure control to, to even favor lower exposures, and tailor these object detection models that are very lightweight and with a slightly higher system clock than is typical, 
uh, with a single digit milliwatt power. So this is not one milliwatt, but somewhere in the range of one to 10 milliwatts. We've actually demonstrated at a previous 10 ml event, uh, 100 FPS phase detection. So this is what we call turbo mode. And this is something that's um, not been you know, uh, seen anywhere else. 100 frame per second phase detection operated at milliwatt levels of power. And uh, we've had a battery operated demo that looks like that. I, I'm sorry, I don't have it with me right now because we're all working from home. Uh, but this is a, a setup where the, the, the QCC112 is located here. And uh, there's just an LED indicator that turns on whenever there is a, a phase that is detected. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, it is so great, and uh, I see many questions on the on the Q and A, and sure. and there are some relevant questions who are really curious about the type of architecture you are using, mm -hmm. like uh, for the supported models. Is it CNN based or just traditional computer vision algorithms? And I also have questions for develop for those, for example, developers who want to build such apps. What kind of developer support is available to allow them to build apps around uh, QCC uh, 112? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we do use traditional computer vision algorithms. CNNs, I mean, we've been doing this since 2017. So CNNs have only been slowly starting to come into uh, you know, the low power domain because the models were extraordinarily large and, and harder to get to run at when we want one milliwatt, right? So I, I do have a teaser slide at the very end where we are talking about our next generation uh, chip that can uh, operate, that can run uh, CNN models. But this is more classical computer vision algorithms uh, uh, for object detection, uh, which are which are able to run at very low power and, and harden a lot of the components there. Um, in terms of developer tools, we do offer a dev kit that uh, can be purchased. I don't have a link to this, but I can add, I, I can put that link in the forums after the talk. And uh, people can purchase a dev kit. This comes with a, a, a QCA 4020 host uh, with, uh, with one of these um, QCC 112 modules attached to it. And uh, we do provide access to the SDK to download models onto it. We provide the training tools to train your own models with whatever data sets you have, and you can test it out using those, the dev kit and the software. Okay, so it's... Uh... So this prototype board or just uh, available on a dev? So it, it is available on a dev kit uh, for, for people to use. Uh, this is a commercially uh, you know, released product. Like you see 112 is commercially released. The dev kit comes with a host board for people to use, a Qualcomm you, host board that people can use. Thanks, Ravi. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, next we'll dive into a little, a little bit about AR, VR, or what we call XR applications uh, that use TinyML. And that is something that we've been looking into recently. A really good talk by Hans Reiserhove, uh, formerly from Facebook Reality Labs. Uh, he gave a talk at the TinyML uh, uh, early, early on during the pandemic. And uh, you can check this out at this link. Uh, it's, a, it's a good overview talk of all the different demands of AR, VR applications and where TinyML can contribute. So if you're interested in this domain, this, that is a really good overview talk. Uh, so I won't go into the, the yeah. overview details, but just talk a little bit about the, some of the things that we've been working on. So uh, eye tracking or uh, pupil detection uh, is as, a follow, as a step towards eye tracking is a very important part for uh, uh, AR VR, right? So this enables downstream AR VR applications, including foveated rendering and other, other things such as iris recognition for authentication. So even if you have a high resolution input image, you can use QCC112 to bin it down to a lower resolution, re perform pupil detection at very uh, low power and lightweight, and then use the ROI detected from QCC112 in the low resolution to crop down a, a region of interest from the high resolution image, and then pass only that ROI to a higher power processor downstream that can either do a further accurate uh, eye gaze tracking or iris recognition. So uh, in typical applications for TinyML, you will see this sort of cascade approach, right? So even in your audio, always on audio use case, there is a wake word that is being detected by the uh, device on the edge and anything that follows that is being transmitted to the cloud to actually translate and understand what the user is asking. So a typical kind of cascade approach can also be used and, and is recommended to be used for such vision applications if you want the overall system power to be optimized. 
Here we show a few different examples of images, uh, videos actually captured by the QCC 112. On the top left, it's just with ambient lighting at 150 lux, and we're showing our uh, pupil detection algorithm. On the top right, you see um, pupil detection on very, very low exposure time. Uh, on, on the top right, you have a contrast stretch version of the video just for visualization purposes. We don't actually use that for, the, for running the detection. The pupil detection is shown in the middle here uh, at the uh, very low expose. And this is similar to what you saw in previous slides for face detection and human detection. At the bottom, you see with uh, specific infrared lighting and most AR VR headsets uh, are very common to have infrared illumination present. And with just one millisecond exposure, the images are, are very visible and our object detection algorithms work really well. Uh, for AR VR applications, you definitely need a high speed solution compared to typical human or face detection applications. Your latency requirements could be as low as one second or 100 millisecond. But uh, for AR VR applications, you really want 60 FPS at the very minimum or even higher. In our particular solution, uh, the image sensor is spec to go up to 60 uh, frames per second. So we've shown that we can reliably run this with a very low exposure of less than one millisecond detection time of just under 10 milliseconds. Uh, we can do uh, re reliably do 60 frame per second uh, pupil detection. We've also shown on individual devices that we can go all the way up to 100 frames per second. And these images are processed at QQVGA because of the relatively constrained use case, you don't need a much higher resolution to detect the pupil. And uh, the model size for this is extremely small, right? It's only about 40 kilobytes. And these are uh, numbers at our 40 megahertz standard clock, but you can increase it. We've run this at the 100 megahertz clock for, um, for a phase detection. And uh, you can tune that based on uh, your application demands and the power will be, you know, will be proportionally higher. Uh, Ravi, uh, with, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you again. Oh, with uh, with respect to the resolution, is it possible? Uh, what resolution is it? Is it possible to detect object in motion? Is there a specific resolution for objects in motion, or is it the same? So uh, that that depends on the object more than the resolution, uh, be, the size of the object, right? Because uh, is the object is uh, small or essentially small in, 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 in the camera image size, right? Like with respect to the resolution. So if the pupil, if the camera is too far away from the eye, the pupil is gonna be very extremely small. So you might need to process it at a higher resolution or you can try to zoom in. And some image sensors provide the capability to zoom in, even if it's a 240 by 320 image sensor, you can use a technique called, uh, they provide a, a thing called telescoping where you can just take the, central 120 by 160 pixels of that. So that's kind of like a zoom that you have, um, a digital zoom that you can use. And, uh, but it boils down to the image size uh, there, there is. The motion, object in motion part, it really boils down to your exposure time and your frame rate that you can run it at. You can run it at a very slow frame rate, but you can choose to expose at a very short time because we do well even with a low exposure if the object is moving fast to avoid motion blur, you can actually just expose it for a very short time, run your detection, uh, expose it for a very short time, run your detection, and that should work just fine. Um, okay. Additionally, you can also augment your training data with motion. Blur. I mean, that's another thing you can do. If you have a, if you're tracking cars and the motion is just too fast for, uh, for a reasonable exposure. Okay, and is there some kind of scheduler for adaptive compute to decide, for example, which frames to process and which frames to skip, which regions to process and which regions to skip, or you process the whole thing? So uh, there is uh, not exactly a scheduler, but in the software SDK, you can choose between running certain change detection algorithms first and processing only the image regions that change or only the image frames that change, or you can specify certain ROIs uh, statically to process. So you, you can do that on a content adaptive basis and the SDK allows you to specify that. Okay, good, Ravi, thanks. Thank you. Yep, um, and uh, yeah, here's a, just a, a simple demo that uh, one of our uh, interns put together where uh, just mapping this to tracking IDS points on the screen uh, where the, uh, the red dot is where the user is asked to look at and the blue dot is where the 
uh, prediction is based on based on just what we do on the QCG 112, right? So ideally, more sophisticated uh, gaze tracking algorithms can be used downstream. But for really coarse applications, we can do just simple things directly on the uh, lightweight processor on the QCG 112. And as I mentioned, this, this demo is actually running on our uh, commercially deployable hardware. Uh, just in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to talk about our training tool. This uh, always on computer vision system portal, AOCVS portal is a training tool that we provide to our customers. So if you get the dev kit, you'll be, you'll get access to this. Uh, this allows you to prep, your, if you come in with your annotated training data, this allows you to prep the data, including data augmentation and um, train your models, convert or compile the models into a binary format that you can download to a hardware. It also allows you to optimize a model in a tuner and benchmark the uh, model performance on an evaluator, which is the bit exact simulator for the hardware. So even without running anything on the hardware, first you can test the full workflow on this, uh, uh, train your model and test it and then optimize it using these desktop tools. And then you can deploy this to the hardware for the final um, uh, application. Uh, this is a browser-based front end. It is a command line interface as well for the back end if you're comfortable, but if you're you want like somewhat of a no code and usage, which has become pretty popular now in ML tools. We have a browser based front end. Uh, it's supposed, supported on both Windows and Linux. You can install it on your machine or on a more powerful remote machine and uh, just access it from the browser. Uh, it has experiment tracking. So all the runs that you've done previously, if you want to compare different models or different data sets, it aids the reproducible results. Also, as I mentioned, we have synthetic data augmentation. So even if you come in, depending on the kind of application, even if you come in with a few images, you can do a lot of data augmentation to uh, generate like tens of thousands of images for your training. And uh, also, as I mentioned before, you don't need to collect training images from the sensor. You can, if you have a benchmark data set or if you have cell phone images, videos, you can use all of that to train models for this. There's no domain transfer issues here. Here's an example of our uh, evaluator, which is a simulator for the hardware where it shows the detection of these fiducial markers and uh, outputs all the metadata that is typically output from the hardware as well. And this is the tuner, uh, which allows uh, you to optimize the model's performance at runtime uh, for using different configuration parameters, right? So by changing different uh, configuration parameters such as stride and merge, uh, which are post-processing or uh, you know, inference parameters, uh, this allows you to operate on different points on this curve that you see on the right. So if you want, it's a true positive versus false positive curve. So if you want to get higher true positives, but you're okay with uh, having some false positives, you can operate at a certain point there and choose the appropriate parameters. Or if you are okay with giving up a little true positives, but false positives are complete no-no, you can operate at that corresponding point and use those parameters. And all of these are for the same model. So without even retaining the model, you have a lot of flexibility in how you define this. And this tuner is a, is, is a common thing that you're also seeing now with other tools that are coming out, optimizing models for runtime. So that's it about the QCC one and two. I just like to end with the last slide here with a teaser about a next generation ultra low power AI engine with a highly efficient neural network inference engine targeted at mostly vision use cases. It supports mobile friendly backbone models such as mobile nets, especially with like depth noise convolution layers and uh, bottleneck blocks. We've demonstrated eye gaze tracking with a 70 kilobyte CNN model with a very competitive gaze estimation error. Also, we've demonstrated a face recognition with a model that's less than one megabyte in size. It runs at 25 frames per second with an estimated uh, five milliwatt of power at uh, 250 megahertz and seven nanometer process node. So stay tuned, uh, we'll see more um, from Qualcomm about this. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity for the speakers and thank you everyone for joining. And uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much Ravi for the great and excellent presentation. I noticed that most like all participants enjoyed your demos and uh, the quality of the questions that have been uh, asked demonstrate how good the presentation and how informative it was. Uh, maybe one last question from the Q uh, and A. Um, uh, do the power numbers include the camera power or just the processing power? Absolutely, it includes the camera power. So 
So we were very particular about optimizing the end-to-end -end power to be less than one milliwatt, and that was a, sort of our you know big target that uh, the image sensor, uh, the I/O power, the processor power, and the power to transmit the metadata out, all of that together is one milliwatt. And, and also one last question. There was a pie chart at the beginning of the presentation with power break down during the start of the talk. And how does the pie chart look like after all the optimizations have been done? That, that is a good question. We've actually not done that. Um, I mean, we don't have a pie chart for that. Uh, I should say we've, uh, we have internal um, you know, Excel sheets and uh, you know, power measurement uh, benchmarks that we have. I don't know if I'm able to comment on that here, but I can give you a ballpark that the, uh, at least between the image sensor uh, power and the, um, and the processing power when you're running object detection, like phase detection at 10 FPS for typical use cases in the one milliwatt uh, sort of total power envelope, a little less, less than half is the image sensor power and approximately half is the processor power and the remaining you know, less than 5% uh, ballpark is about the IO power and other things. Okay, thank you very much, Ravi, for the great quality of the presentation. If uh, the other panelists don't have any questions or, or the audience, we're going to wrap up um, this. Uh, I this have one great... quick question, Haja. Yeah, sure, Muna. Yeah. So, Ravi, uh, you mentioned uh, you include data augmentation in your tool suites. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on uh, the size of the data sets you require prior to the augmentation? Right, so it depends on the application, of course. So for simple things like the financial markers or product logos, we've, uh, we, need a, we actually need a lot of uh, negative images depending on where the object is being, uh, the model is being deployed, right? So if you're looking against a, a relatively static environment, like for eye tracking, the background is not very different. So you'd need only a few images. And uh, for logos, the positive images that you need uh, of the object that you want to detect, you can train with even just like one image of positive images. But if you're trying to do face detection, right? Yeah. You want to be very careful that you have a good diversity of the data set. Um, you know, people of you know, different ethnicities, different genders, and also uh, with different facial features, like people with beards, mustaches, uh, you know, all sorts mm -hmm. of facial features, wearing sunglasses, um, you know, full head of hair, bald head of hair, different hairstyles. So that diversity is very important. And it really boils down to how much, how many images you need to get to that level of diversity that you need. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and in typical, like in our uh, face detection example, I think we use about, um, for a really robust and diverse model, uh, we uh, have something over 20,000 to 30,000 images, positive mm -hmm. images that we used. Thank okay, you, thank, you. thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much again for the quality of the of the, of the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to to, to answer the five question poll that have been uh, just popped up in the in the screen. Uh, so thank you very much. I want again to thank our sponsors. Uh, uh, Aeon Devices, RM Deployed, AG Impulse, MZA, Green Waves, Latent AI, Hot Z, Imagine Mob, Maxim Integrated Analog Devices, Qualcomm Reality AI, QXO, Seed, SenseML, and Sentient uh, for sponsoring the event. And just to remind you that ARM is the software and hardware uh, foundation for uh, TinyML. And uh, deep light. We use AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Tiny ML for all developers. EMSA, the I in IoT, each AI visual sensors. Uh, enabling the next generation of sensor and hearable products to process rich data with energy efficiency, green waves technologies and uh, hot C for distributed in infrastructure for tiny ML apps, or G, sorry. <laughs> and latent AI, adaptive AI for the intelligent edge. And Maxim integrated, enabling edge intelligence.
for advanced other, and Xico Auto ML automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. And Qualcomm AI research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. And we've seen with Ravi the excellent, uh, the excellent uh, presentation of the always on computer vision sensor. Reality AI, how they add advanced sensing to your product with HAI Tiny ML. And Sensei ML, how to build smart IoT sensor devices from data. Sense to build sensing and inference hardware for ultra low powered uh, embedded mobile and edge devices. And Sentient, neural decision processors and ML training pipeline, as well as data platform. And be uh, ready for our next Tiny ML Talks on Tuesday, October 12th by David Schwartz. And the topic will be Auto ML and Tiny ML with Edge Impulse's Aeon Tuner. And thank you very much uh, for uh, following this talk. Thank you.